Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Naji Koinoue, Professor Emeritus at Kyushu University. Um, this is part of the Japan-US exchange debate 2023. We had uh, past two events or three events online, but before that we had a long history of face-to-face uh, -face, uh, tour. The American team came to Japan, traveled around campuses, had debates and lectures and so on. Uh, alternative year, the Japanese team visited American campuses, had debates, etc. Now we are back in face to face, and this time, this year, this is American team's first stop in Japan. And in this first session, um, we have uh, two debate coaches. The John Koch from Vanderbilt University and Kenneth Newby from Mulhouse College. And we have two debaters, uh, Nine Abad and Daniel Atti. Uh, they are preparing for the debate with Kyushu University uh, debaters for the fourth period and fifth period debate. And in this first uh, session, the first um, John and Ken will talk about a valid debate related to their own careers, academic professional careers, about 15 minutes each, and then we will get into more informal session. But after each speaker, if you have a quick question, you can ask questions. And also, if you have anything you don't understand in the middle, maybe you can just raise your hand. I think the yeah, Americans are very flexible about that. So do not hesitate to stop the talk and ask questions. OK, with that further ado, I object to you to go to John first. Okay, uh, good. Or, 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 Tennessee, and uh, we're just going to kind of talk about the benefits. Ken and I are going to talk about the benefits and the value of debate, and we're going to do that. I'm going to talk about the value of debate uh, to society, and within that I'll talk about my academic career, and then Ken's going to talk about the value of debate to individuals and also connect that to his academic and legal career. So my debate story, uh, I was a first-generation college student. Uh, only one out of my four grandparents even graduated high school. In fact, only one out of the four even went further than uh, ninth grade. And so my parents graduated high school and then I went to college. And it wasn't until college that I discovered debate. And it's not an exaggeration to say that debate changed my life. Because of debate, I learned critical thinking skills. I learned public speaking skills. I learned research skills. All things that later served me as I went to graduate school and got a master's degree and a PhD at Wayne State University, which is in Detroit, Michigan. So because of debate, I was able to get a college education. I was able to uh, get a PhD. And it's also allowed me to see the world. In fact, this is my second time in Japan this year. We had the opportunity to visit Tokyo earlier uh, this year in March when the International Forensics Association hosted their tournament in Tokyo. And in terms of my academic career, like I said, debate gave me the opportunity to get a PhD, but it's also my academic research is centered around uh, debate and democracy, right? How can we use debate as a tool to educate students? How can we use debate to experiment with models to improve? 
our democratic institutions, and our democratic society. So what I want to spend most of my time on today is talking about the importance of debate and democracy and how that relates to all of us. Because it's no secret, anybody following the news in the United States that and the world, that democracy is under attack around the world, with people growing increasingly dissatisfied with their systems of government. In the United States, we're dealing with a mistrust of our democratic institutions, questions about our election integrity, which uh, in 2020 resulted in the storming of our Capitol building. We also have increasing polarization between our political parties. We have gerrymandering of congressional districts, uh, just to name a few current issues. Uh, in Japan, according to the Pew Research Center, almost six out of 10 Japanese citizens are dissatisfied with the way democracy is working in Japan. A majority think politicians are corrupt and that no matter who wins, nothing will change. And in fact, only 35% of Japanese citizens think that the government uh, is working for them and cares about them. So, as with the United States, citizens in Japan think that democracy is not working for them because they mistrust their institutions and, the represent and their representatives in government. And obviously, for those of us who care about democracy, free speech, and the ability for, uh, for our voices as citizens to make a positive impact on society, this news is disheartening. However, the fact that all of you are here today to listen to Ken and I and hopefully stay around for the debates shows that you're likely to support debate, debate education, civic education, and democracy. Thus, uh, I just want to spend a little bit of time discussing with you the benefits and value of debate in a democratic society. So, according to U.S. scholar J. Michael Hall Hogan and his call and his co-authors, democracy and speech making are intertwined. They can, these authors continue since ancient times, as B. Briggins wrote, we have never had a successful democracy unless a large part, a very large part, of its citizens were effective, intelligent, and responsible speakers. Furthermore, America's great experiment in democracy rested upon a citizenry trained not only to speak and debate, but also to listen and judge. And so, with that, let's break that down in its, its various parts. So we see three reasons why debate is important to a successful democracy. One, it teaches us to be intelligent, responsible, and effective speakers. It teaches us to listen. And three, it teaches us to judge. And all of these things that debate teaches directly tie to the concerns citizens have about the current state of democracy. First, teaching how to be an effective, intelligent, responsible speaker gives average citizens the best chance to express themselves and gives them the ability to affect change. Two, teaching everyone to be responsible speakers teaches us to be ethical, right? So if we have a distrust because we think our politicians are unethical or they're corrupt, teaching ethics and responsibility becomes important. Three, teaching how to listen teaches the skill that debate is not about listening just to respond to other people's arguments but actually understand that there are multiple sides of an issue, which is a skill that's necessary to decrease political polarization and to actually understand each other and view us as citizens within a democracy that are trying to reach the best way for society to operate and that we're not each other's enemy. And then finally, in terms of judging, debate teaches us how to evaluate evidence and compare arguments. It teaches, us how to, it teaches us to evaluate arguments, compare evidence, uh, figure out the costs and benefits, and arrive at a decision, right? Which is really what democracy is, a process that allows all citizens to engage and figure out what is the best decision that we can reach in order for society to move forward, which requires us to be able to reach a compromise. As J. Michael Hogan and his co-author state, Debate teaches students not only to be better speakers and critical listeners, but also to be more informed, engaged, and responsible citizens. By studying speech and debate, students develop a keen appreciation for solid research, 
well-reasoned arguments, and effective delivery. Students who study speech and debate develop a better understanding of the rights and responsibilities of free speech, and they become more attuned to the threats to our democracy posed by propaganda and demagoguery. They learn how to solve problems collaboratively, and they develop a better appreciation for the diversity of perspectives and opinions in our complex, multicultural society. In short, debate teaches the fundamental skills of democratic citizenship. How to research, make and present arguments, listen to other points of view, compare and evaluate multiple positions, and arrive at a decision. All these skills are vital to democracy because they are necessary in order for a society to make decisions. In addition, debate teaches us to have a democratic disposition. According to U.S. scholars Zorwick and Wade, debate teaches students respect for others, a sense of moral responsibility, and self-discipline. Along with critical thinking, and a willingness to listen and work with others. So, in short, debate teaches students to develop a disposition that promotes honesty, critical thinking, and collaboration. This sees democracy as a process that requires us all to work together for the betterment of society. So, by now I hope that I've established that debate is beneficial and adds value to a society, especially a democratic society. But a question we often get is, can we quantify this? Or is it all anecdotal? And we can quantify this through various surveys we've done of debaters and how debate has impacted uh, their education and how they see the world. So according to U.S. scholar Ross, Mac Ross McDonald, who did a survey of uh, debate students in the U.S., he found that 98% of students in the United States who did debate uh, thought that their political awareness had been increased because of their participation in debate. He found that 86% thought that debate increased their social awareness. 98% said it made them more aware of global issues. 96% said that it increased their critical thinking skills. 76% said that it increased their self-confidence. And 92% said that it fostered uh, personal connections that they wouldn't have otherwise made during their education. Additionally, uh, Wade and Zorik also studied the importance of using debate as a teaching pedagogy within the classroom, and they found that 92% of teachers who used debate as a teaching method in the classroom found substantial growth in student engagement, 88% reported substantial skill development, 83% reported increased content learning, 90% reported positive improvements in the student classroom interactions, and 90% reported more positive student-teacher interactions. So if we break this data down, we see, I think, four very important things that show how important debate is to teaching skills, but also bettering society and our democratic institutions. The first is that the data shows it increases social, political, and global awareness, which are all important for knowing and learning from others and considering their perspectives. Secondly, the data shows it increases critical thinking skills, which is necessary for us to evaluate and compare evidence and arguments. Third, the data shows that it increases self-confidence and engagement, right, which makes people more willing to actually engage in the political process. And fourth, it shows that it fosters personal connections. Even in one of the most competitive forms that democracy can take, which is academic debate, where you are trying to win and beat your opponent, it, it showed that people make friendships through debate. In fact, 92% of debaters reported that, right? That debate, while competitive, is actually a place where they found collaboration. So, in conclusion, I hope that I demonstrated to you today the benefits and value of debate to sustaining and improving our democratic societies, which is the root of my academic research and my professional career. Uh, in a world where democracy is under attack and citizens are more skeptical than ever of their democratic institutions, those of us who care about democracy 
Debate offers a way to solve this situation. Debate pro provides us with the necessary skills of democratic citizenship and fosters a democratic disposition. As Susan Herbst writes, we need to teach young people how to argue with vigor, intelligence, and panache. We need to create a culture of argument, and we need to do this on a mass scale throughout our public and private schools. If we cannot teach our children how to reason and articulate their ideas, they will find themselves in the same dysfunctional situation their parents currently live in. Debate offers a better democratic tomorrow. As students and educators committed to debate and democracy, we need to continue to promote the values of debate to our administrators and our government. Healthy debate may well be the best defense we, the best defense we have to maintain the health of our democratic societies. Debate teaches the very things that are the bedrock of democracy. That is its value. I can think of no other academic activity that is more valuable, and that is true of the activity writ large and also for my own life. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, any quick question for clarification? Uh, do you think that kind of say uh, uh, debate or debate uh, culture in the states in the U.S. Uh, still works now in, the, in, uh, in, in this present political situation? Yeah, I think in the United States there's still a lot of support for debate and debate culture. We're very fortunate at Vanderbilt University to have a chancellor who is very supportive of the First Amendment and free speech and the freedom of expression and uh, trying to do more of that on campus, so we're actually planning more public debates. Uh, we're going to be hosting the Rwandan national team this year. Uh, we're hopeful that uh, the Japanese team will visit us when they come in the spring next year. So I think there still is a debate culture. I think the format of debate in the United States has changed a lot. Uh, NDTC, the policy debate, used to be the preeminent format in the United States, but now there are lots of different formats. So a lot of schools and universities still have debate teams, but we're all kind of do, doing different things. But as a culture, I think there's still strong support in the United States. Thank you very much. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, this, that's an important point to be how debate culture is functioning in the US or in other countries, but we may be able to come back to that topic later. So now uh, we would like to ask uh, Ken to talk about his career and value of debate. Konnichiwa. Thank you for providing me today with this invaluable opportunity to share my experiences and insights with you on the value debate. I, I want to share my love of debate with you. Even though it's value, like in life, debate is filled with wonderful contradictions. Uh, I want to start this discussion off first with a question. How many of you love debate? Put your hand up if you love debate. Just like, I love debate, debate is great. No hands up. Now, I think that's an incredible oxymoron. Why? Because even though none of you love debate, you are here for a lecture about the value of debate and about how wonderful and how great debate is, even though you yourselves don't love it yet, like I do. And that's okay. I was watching, how many people watch Instagram? I'm guilty of this. I saw Instagram. I was surfing my social network, social media this morning and saw a, a wonderful thing that said, you know, people get bored in childhood and they hurry to grow up, but then they miss their childhood. They lose their health to earn money, but then pay money to regain their health. They're worried about tomorrow, so they forget about today, and in the end they live as if they will never die, only to die as if they never lived. Life is filled with contradictions. In debate, we learn how to disagree, ironically, so that we can come 
to an agreement. We learn how to criticize conclusions so that we can arrive at the right conclusion. In our effort to persuade others of our subjective truths, we inherently search for the objective truths presented by all issues. Debate, in spite of its oxymorons, has value, both to me as an attorney and a college professor, because it's both prepared me for my professions while simultaneously remaining at my side as a principal tool to guide me in my life. A bit about me. Uh, as you heard, my name is Professor Ken Newby. I'm a professor at Morehouse College. I teach communication studies classes, mostly debate-related classes and argumentation classes, including argumentation and debate and legal argumentation. When I'm not teaching debate or coaching debate, I'm actually living in the real world of argumentation because I still practice as an attorney. And my litigation practice is focused on business disputes. So every day during the day, I'm researching, developing, and making arguments. And then in the evenings and on the weekends, I'm teaching others how to make arguments and how to do the same. And so my life revolves around an argument, and that's okay because without that, I wouldn't be here with all of you. And that is a wonderful opportunity that I will cherish. And it's, it's the unique value, the fascinating intersection between the skills that are fostered in academic debate and practical application in the legal field that I want to talk to you about just briefly today. It's my hope that this exploration will shed light not only on the profound importance of debate skills themselves, but also inspire you to further cultivate these abilities within your respective fields. Because debate, even though I'll use a legal lens, is not just for lawyers. Debate, I would suggest to you, is for everyone. Because discourse, critical thinking, consideration of evidence, and reaching the correct conclusions, and most importantly, learning how to correctly disagree with one another, or what former war champion of debate, Bo Sayo says, how to have good arguments is profoundly important. So let's first begin by talking briefly about the value of debate in academia. And I think one of the things that debate does is it allows you to build a foundation. We talk often about the importance of critical thinking. You heard my colleague, uh, Professor Koch, talk about how debate helps you become a better critical, thinking, critical thinker. That, and that's the case because it's one thing to present an argument, often in public speaking, in many situations, you'll learn how to present an argument, you'll give a speech. I'm sure everyone has probably either given a speech or will have to give a speech at some point to try to persuade someone of something. But what debate teaches you is how when that speech or that argument is criticized, it teaches you how to defend it. It teaches you how to prepare for that defense, how to get ahead of it, so that you are prepared, so that you've actually thought about all sides of it so that you can appreciate the weaknesses in your own argument and the strengths of your opponent's argument and not become mired down in sort of this myopic view of only what you think is correct. It also helps you to develop research skills that teaches you how to investigate and evaluate real world problems and their solutions. It gives you a framework to, adapt, to, to do this. It also helps you understand the importance of understanding different perspectives. This is the foundation that the great, wonderful activity of debate as a skill equips you with. Doesn't it sound great? Are you getting excited? You're going to want to learn more. I know once we leave, you're going to say, hey, we need more. We need more debate classes at the university. It's so great. What about the classroom experience for debate? In the classroom, when debate is applied as a teaching tool, because in some places, instead of lectures, professors engage in debates. In some places, instead of giving an exam or asking a student to write a paper, what professors do, is, at least in the United States, is they say, you know, I'm going to use debate as another tool, another method for evaluation. And what the studies have shown is that it's an incredibly valuable and powerful method for active learning. Studies have actually established that students learn more, they integrate more knowledge, they learn how to apply the knowledge that they're learning in the classroom better when they're forced to practice that in application through debate as a tool. Secondly, in the classroom, it helps you develop effective 
communication skills. Anyone have a fear of public speaking? Put your hand up if you have a fear of public speaking. It's okay. Everyone else is a great public speaker? Oh, see, I knew I was in a room full of debaters. Everyone else is confident. Everyone else feels like they can speak well. I love it. So you definitely should get involved in debates that you have no fear of public speaking. You have fear even to raise them. You have fear to even raise your hands is what the professor says. Uh, yeah, even to do that. But what debate helps do, it helps to inspire confidence in your own thinking. It helps you to know and be more comfortable with standing up, not just raising your hand, but speaking up, speaking your mind, sharing your thoughts. It reminds you of it's okay, especially in a democracy where freedom of expression and freedom of speech is cherished. That's why Professor Koch was talking so much about the role of debate within a democracy. Lastly, the broader impacts in academia. Because with debate, it helps to prepare students for a wide array of different careers. Obviously law, which I'll talk about in a sec, but I think any career debate helps you prepare for. I've had students, for example, who have been engineering students. And engineering students gain incredible communication skills because very often they're great with the numbers, they're great with the math, they're great with the science that you need to know to be an engineer. But when they go for that interview, for that first engineering job, they might struggle. They might struggle with answering those difficult questions. But those students who have that debate experience excel. You may want to go to graduate school. Undergraduate may not be your last stop. You may want to get a master's or a PhD, or you'll have to defend a dissertation. Debate helps you to prepare to answer questions, and most importantly, to think on your feet to both answer questions and defend your positions. Next, in the interest of time, I'm going to talk about the value of debate in legal practice. Because I use debate every day, every week of my life. Three important ways. First, case preparation. Debate is a tool for uncovering and understanding all aspects of a case. The same way in debate you have to research and know every aspect of an issue, if you want to debate it properly, that's what you have to do when you're a lawyer, when you're an advocate for someone for a case, arguing a legal position. It also helps you craft persuasive arguments and to anticipate the counter arguments. And certainly no lawyer wants to walk into a courtroom who has not anticipated their adversary's counter arguments. Because if you don't, you may not win your case. In the courtroom, the role of debate is invaluable in courtroom presentation and witness examination. In particular, because it's common in most formats of debate, uh, both in the Japanese formats where there is a cross-examination period, a defined, and you're going to see that in the, in the debate that you're going to see today, where there's a defined period of time where your opponent gets to ask you questions about your argument. That's what it means to be under cross-examination. And practicing that skill is a great way to teach you how to expose the flaws in your opponent's arguments and also to highlight the strengths of your own, particularly when your opponent can't answer those difficult questions that you've learned how to ask through debate. But secondly, like most discussions or analysis, debate teaches you how to frame a narrative. Because framing is very important in how issues get decided. This is a wonderful skill that politicians use all the time. They'll frame the narrative. They'll paint us a picture. And we'll believe that picture so much that we're willing to vote for them. We're willing to go with what they say. Lawyers do the same thing when they're in the courtroom. They frame the case for the jury or for the judge. And they're framing that narrative. That framing of the narrative is a skill in and of itself that helps to persuade your audience, whoever that be, whether that's a jury, whether that's a judge, whether that's the community, whether that's an audience in a college classroom, how you frame a discussion is a very important part of whether you're able to persuade that audience to the conclusion that you desire. Next, conflict resolution and negotiation. Because the importance of debate skills and this comes from, I'll give you one example. In the world format of debate, the World University Debating Championship, and you should know, 
you had a, a, a championship team in 2020, a team from this university uh, were the world champions in the English as a second language category uh, at the world championship. And one thing that's a feature of world championship debating is a process known as consensus judging. And that's where you put three or more judges in a room, they may disagree about the opinion of who did the best debating in the round. They all have a common goal. That common goal is to decide together as a group, let's reach a consensus on who did the best debating. Let's rank all the teams in that round in order of who did the best debating. And if we disagree, we're going to have to have a discussion about that. We're going to have to persuade each other so that at the end of our 15 minute discussion, uh, we have an agreement on that. Let me suggest to you, those are the exact same skills that you need as an attorney, or anyone for that matter, managing conflict and trying to get to a resolution. Because when you have conflict or you have a negotiation, both sides are trying to get to an agreement. Both sides are trying to resolve the conflict. They may have different opinions. They may have different perspectives. They may have heard things that were of different importance to them, just like those judges from that debate round. But they're going to work together to reach that consensus. In, in Cameroon, uh, which is a country that's been plagued by civil violence and war, they have a saying about debate. They call it the 21st century alternative to violence. Because it is not through violence that we will build democratic society. It's through nonviolence. It's through the ability to reach these consensuses. It's through our ability to have these discussions with different opinions, different perspectives, and then to be able to come together. And that's one thing that we get from debate. So in conclusion, I hope you can see both how debate plays a valuable role in building individuals in academia, but also plays an invaluable role in our legal systems, no matter what country you're from, and why I love debate so much, and why debate is so important to me. After all, debate brought me here with you. And if it wasn't for debate, I wouldn't have the wonderful opportunity to engage in these intercultural exchanges around the world to talk about this wonderful activity. So I'll end with this, a simple question. Can I see a show of hands of who thinks debate is great? Yes? You're still shy, it's okay. But I see a few more hands at the end of the lecture than I saw at the beginning and that means I've at least persuaded some of you. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Um, quick questions for Ken? Okay. Then we're going to more informal discussion about various topics the both speakers mentioned. And also, you can ask about other things related to the debate. Great education. Uh, then let me. Oh. I'm just going to throw a bit of a curveball. Um, I think the question there's a kind of tension in um, the aspiration for debate to be something that all should be able to cultivate, uh, no matter their class or their ethnic background. And a certain kind of reality where debate becomes a means for, for acquiring, entrenching, and expressing class privilege, particularly the privilege of those who go to the upper reaches of the university system, or the elite universities, and come to constitute the modern day professional managerial class. Uh, and then, of course, this itself becomes uh, an expression of, of polarization. There's the haves, the people who have the, the ability to be glib and to, to I, I guess, to, to address one of the potential vices of debating skill, to be able to talk over people who are less articulate than, than they are, uh, versus others who are less able to uh, engage in that kind of practice. So actually what I was going to ask you is, well, how developed is K1 to 12 education and pr promoting uh, debating skill, you know, across class boundaries as well as ethnic boundaries in the United States at the moment, because it's not a country I know very much about, to be honest. Uh, I think I'd like to start with answering that, or attempting to answer that very broad question. First, thank you for that question. I think it highlights some important considerations when we talk about debate. 
Uh, my, my answer may be a little long, so bear with me. Uh, first, a little more context. You heard that I'm a professor at Morehouse College. But what is Morehouse College? Morehouse College was founded in 1867. It is a historically black college and university. There are currently 105 historically black colleges and universities in the United States. And many of these colleges and universities were founded either during or right after reconstruct the Reconstruction era as a response to the post-slavery uh, post era, uh, frankly, when education in America was very much still segregated and a lack of opportunity for African Americans was certainly the norm. Uh, debate started at Morehouse College in 1906, and we've had a debate program of some sort uh, since that time. The debate back then uh, consisted of public exhibition debates amongst other HBCUs, uh, and then later broadened. There's a great movie called The Great Debaters starring Denzel Washington that sort of paints this picture of what used to happen with these types of debates historically. Uh, Fast forward, and many great debaters uh, have just, I'll just use Morehouse College as my continuing example, have, who have transformed our society, have come from Morehouse using debate and using arguments to transform society. Probably our most notable, most famous alum globally is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, who graduated from uh, Morehouse College. Uh, at a very young age, <laughs> he went through, he started Morehouse before he was even 18, I think he started when he was 15, uh, 15 years old. And of course, he had probably one of the most transformative arguments of all time in America, and that was this idea of equality, this idea that everyone was deserving of equal opportunity, and we cannot maintain a stable or fair and just civil society without granting that equal opportunity to everyone. And it was not through the power of violence, he explicitly disavowed violence, it was through the power of nonviolence and speech. I encourage you to read his speeches, oh my gosh. So many great speeches of his, I could recount, um, that took the argument, took that basic principled argument to American society and engaged it and organized around it and created riots, not riots, created protests rather, and created, uh, organized a, a whole movement that we call the Civil Rights Movement that ultimately led to very real legislative change because a lot of minds had to get persuaded in order to enact that change. That change did not come about easily. Now I'm getting more directly to answer your question, I haven't lost it, because the question was about what about America today? in K through 12 public schools. So that's great history, Professor Newby, but the question was about today, I haven't forgotten that. Today, uh, there are several things with, at that level to make sure that debate is a great equalizer and not a great divider. Number one, you have uh, the expansion of what are called urban debate leagues. Almost every major city in the United States actually has an urban debate league. The specific mission of the Urban Debate Leagues are to, uh, and they serve in primarily um, majority minority communities, first of all, because that's just the majority of most inner cities in the United States. And so they're creating these debate leagues because debate can, as an as a intellectual sport in the United States, it can be exclusionary because it costs money, first of all, to travel to tournaments. And if your school is in an impoverished area and it has no budget and you're individually or personally have no money, you lack the resources to be able to say pay for your, your own food even if you travel to a tournament, that's a very real problem and a very real barrier to your participation in these tournaments. So urban debate leagues were created as a response to that to help solve and deal with some of those problems and to create opportunities more locally that would be accessible so that all would have that opportunity in order to access debate. But that's not where it stops. Because secondarily, ideologically, debate has become more diverse, more open to different types of thoughts. In the United States, there are a variety of different arguments, everything from what are known as critical arguments or critiques uh, that are offered in debate that I understand may not be as popular 
uh, here in Japan, but in the United States, people tap into uh, theory uh, like uh, Afro-pessimism or Afro-futurism. They tap into various uh, intellectual theories and they formulate their arguments around them, and then they're allowed to present these ideas based on these different ideological premises. They get challenged, because it is a debate, but then they get to sort of hash that out. They get to speak their truth. They get to have a, a, an ethnographic review, for example, and put their real narrative before someone so that if you're, say, debating an issue of uh, African American, whether African Americans should be entitled to reparations or not, you can talk about that from your perspective and then the unique harm that you face as an African American who is forced to serve under the economic oppression that you experience in real life. And I think amplifying those voices, giving the opportunity for those voices to be heard is uniquely valuable in order to address those types of issues that, 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 really, that really brought your question on. But lastly, and this is a bit more personal, because I learned how to debate in 1988. That's when I started high school debate. And it carried me through high school, it carried me through college, and now it continues to carry me in, uh, in my career. For the most part, when I was growing up, it was not a intellectual sport that was dominated by any means by African Americans. Many times I was the only black student uh, at tournaments. Many times. Today I take my students to tournaments where there are far and few between, this is at the intercollegiate level, uh, black students at those tournaments. We come and we often provide the diversity that exists at those tournaments. But in spite of that reality and the challenges that that creates, I have still seen my students go on to do great and wonderful things. I just, two, before I came on this trip, I had lunch in San Francisco with one of my students who's currently at Harvard Law School. Uh, another one of my students I wrote a riddle, uh, just got into Stanford Law School. I've got, you name any top law school, frankly, in the country, and students from the Morehouse debate team specifically have gone on to be there. The current editor of the journal at the, at the Constitutional Law Journal at the University of Pennsylvania Law School is a Morehouse grad, but specifically a Morehouse debate grad. I could just go on and on and on with the top universities, top PhD programs, top law schools, even top medical school programs and top computer science programs. We have a master's student at Carnegie Mellon right now who, did a, uh, who worked for Google for two years right after graduation. It, the list goes on and on, and it's all because in spite of all those challenges that you brought up, debate gave them skills that gave them the ability to compete anywhere and everywhere, and they're doing that. And that's why I will continue to extol the value of debate as being that bridge that can help raise everyone regardless of your station in life or the challenges you may face as a result of being born, unfortunately, into that station. Sorry for the long answer. <laughs> nice one, uh, just a brief follow-up. I think Ken covered the question pretty well. I think uh, in my uh, lecture, right, I said debate changes life, and debate does have the potential to change life. I talked about my own story, right? Uh, economically, right, uh, I have one grandparent who graduated High school, first generation, uh, me and my cousin were the first generation of the family to go to college and debate dramatically changed my life. It changed my ability to be able to do well in school. It changed the trajectory of my life to here in 2023, right? I ended up in Japan in front of all of you. But I think your point is good that we have to always remain aware that access to debate can be exclusionary. Urban debate leagues are one way in the United States that we have tried to address that. But I always talk about right being able to coach debate and teach debate and be a debater for monetary reasons and a bunch of other reasons is a privilege and we have to keep that privilege in mind and give make sure that we are using debate also to give back to the community. So one thing we do at Vanderbilt is elementary and middle school debate. So we partner with Metro Nashville schools to uh, uh, us as coaches and then our debaters go in and teach debate and these culminate in tournaments and you have great experiences with that. And, uh, Nashville is divided by the Cumberland River and we meet students who you know are in fourth and fifth grade and they live in they've lived in Nashville their whole life but they've never crossed the river. 
right? They never cross the river until they're coming to Vanderbilt's campus to debate. So, yeah, I, I, like I said, it's a very good question. It's a very good point. I think it's incumbent on us who have this privilege to make sure that we are giving back our communities and trying to give this access to as many people as possible. Any other questions? Then different. Okay. Hello. I'm sorry I came in late because I missed a bus. I'm very sorry about that. Um, and I don't know if this question has been asked already. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'd like to know about what you think about using debate to. Um, create people who will be politically active for good because they can just as easily become politically active for bad. There's no easy answer to that and also what kind of relationship, um, if debate is a ritualized conflict, um, how does that affect people who want to use debate to keep peace rather than start a war? Those Massive questions, but things I'm grappling with now, so I'd really like your experience. So, we talked about debate as a skill and as a tool, and of course, like any tool, it can be, as you so aptly observed, be used for good and bad, good or bad. But I think academic debate, so that is debate in high schools or colleges and universities, reinforces the training of what I'll call the good debater or the ethical the ethical mind. Why is that? We teach something called fallacies in debate. We teach about logical fallacies. And logical fallacies are just that. They're, they're fallacious reasoning. They're things that you shouldn't do um, because the logic is unsound. And of course, you shouldn't make arguments based on logic that's not sound. Now, when I'm, when I'm teaching that particular chapter to my students, the first question I always ask them is if, well, if, if illogical arguments are, are so bad, why does anyone use them? If they're so bad, why are they used? Simple answer is because they work. The fallacies work. And so then the question becomes upon you as an ethical speaker, are you going to be an ethical speaker? Are you going to rely upon something that you know, maybe it does work, but you know normatively it shouldn't because the logic is not sound. In the debate world, I would like to believe, when it's done right, reinforces that we're not going to give you victories based on arguments that are not logically sound. Your very real penalty at the tournament will be you lose. Why? Because your argument was filled with all of these logical fallacies, which even if they work in the real world, will not be accepted at this tournament. You won't get the trophy. You won't advance the finals. You won't get the prize. You lose. And so from that perspective, the debate tournaments are reinforcing something that's very positive about argumentation that's not necessarily taught in the real world because logical fallacies and unethical arguments can be persuasive, unfortunately. But I would like to think that debate as an academic activity teaches us and reinforces why we still shouldn't use them. And I think this goes a little bit back to the previous question as well. Not only do I think that we have a responsibility to try to bring access to debate as many people as possible, those of us who care about debate in our democratic institutions also have a responsibility to provide good models of debate. And I can't speak to other countries, but certainly in the United States, if you turn on our cable news networks, our presidential debates, citizens do not have very good models for how to engage in productive debate. So one thing as experts and scholars in this field, or those of us who care, we have the responsibility to put on public debates, which are going to happen uh, after this lecture, to show people what does debate look like that can be productive, that can result in some type of compromise or uh, collaboration where we can actually make decisions where it's not just about fighting, where it's not about trying to, you know, beat your opponent, but it's about trying to get to, you know, what society needs to get to in order to make policy uh, policy decisions. And so your second question was about violence, right? I think that really speaks to that. I think a lot of our political discourse, right, promotes people who disagree with us as the enemy, somebody who's not a real citizen of whatever country 
that because they don't agree with us politically, right? So I think a showing people a model of debate that shows that we're pluralistic, right? It's okay for people to disagree, but we need to also be able to reach decisions without villainizing each other is important. Hello. Um, thank you very much for those um, answers. I've just got um, another one. How far can we expect a personalist ethic? So I see you and I see that you are an ethical speaker, um, but how far can I expect personalist ethics to translate into social, socially conscious ethics? From the personal to the social, how does that, you know, move across? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I think uh, in my public speaking classes, we talk about a lot of different models of ethics. And one of the models that I talk about is John Dewey. John Dewey was a turn of the 20th century uh, pragmatist in the United States. And he is very interested at the turn of the century. So in the United States, at the turn of the century, we have, um, we have the Industrial Revolution starting. There starts to be a big gap between the rich and the poor. He thinks that our democratic system right, is being dominated by those who are rich, right? So he is interested in developing a social ethics. And he says what's important for the, us to teach who are interested in these kinds of things is, the, is uh, social consequences, right? That we shouldn't uh, give a speech or debate or advocate for something that we know will cause, that might be beneficial to us, but overall will do more harm than good. He also talks about that there needs to be, everybody needs to have access to the, for access to our democratic spaces, right, in order for it to work. So I don't think there's an easy answer, but I think those of us who are teaching in university or teaching K through 12 level, right, those of us who are interested in debate and democracy, we need to teach our students, right, that it's not only a personal ethics, right, but we also have to work to develop these social ethics as well to think about others. And uh, I'm asked at, at Vanderbilt sometimes, right, we're talking about, uh, well, we're talking about logical fallacies, right? I'm like, you should do good research. You should only quote things, right, that you know are coming from good sources. And students look at our current political condition and they go, it looks like lying works, right? It looks like I can say whatever, but I should just say whatever I want. And my answer to that usually is that what politics is supposed to be about, what democracy is supposed to be about, is, right, it's, it's societal. It's coming to the best decision that we can come to in our current time in order to make that decision. So when we are lying to each other and we accept lying as a persuasive means, right, that only hurts ourselves and the society, right, because we're not getting at truth, right, for what, in order to make a decision. And I also tell them, right, that, what you're seeing is lying as short-term gain, right? If I give a speech, and I always, I, I give an, in, 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 at Vanderbilt in the U.S. context, I always go, if I was to give a speech, and let's say I give a speech for the United States to abolish the death penalty, and I give that speech, and in that moment I convince you that we should abolish the death penalty, but I lied to you, I, I misrepresented facts. If you, once you leave the classroom, then you're going to go, if you go back to your dorm, right, and you tell your classmate, John just gave this speech, I agree with him, we should abolish the death penalty, and your roommate asks you why, and you go, well, John said A, B, and C, and B was a lie, and your roommate says that, you're probably not going to believe me anymore, right? So very short term, I convinced you, but I didn't give you the tools, I, I didn't convince you for the long term, and if I really was passionate about abolishing the death penalty, right, I need to give you the tools for the long term. So as public speakers and debaters, if I persuade you by lying, I might have convinced you for 15 minutes it took you to walk from this classroom to your dorm. But if I convince you by telling you the truth, I've not only convinced you in that moment, but I've also given the tools you need to then talk to your roommate. And then your roommate can tell somebody else, right? And if it's based on the truth, that is going to have a better long term impact than if I just lied to try to convince you in that moment. My brief answer to that, and I'll just sort of restate, I think, the spirit of the question, 
which was how do we translate, you know, sort of the, 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 the subjective, the personalistic ethic to a collective ethic. And I think we have to remember in a global society, we're talking about a global society of pluralism, which means different cultures, different perspectives, different opinions, different value systems, sometimes which may come into conflict with one another. But the central question remains for us all, how can we live and work together? I think the way debate translates that personal into the collective is by teaching us collectively to tolerate difference. Fundamentally, if debate teaches you nothing else, it has to teach you how to tolerate difference. Difference of opinion, difference of perspective, and how to deal with difference, how to deal with when someone says something that you disagree with. What do you do, what do, you do about that? Do you fight, do you protest, or do you defend and explain and articulate the substantial reasons for that difference in an effort to try to reach a consensus or at least a common understanding? Uh, I think we can't reconcile necessarily all of the, the various value conflicts that will arise naturally within any, any society or within the globe. But one value we all can sort of hold dear to is tolerance, so that we're not acting in intolerant ways that suppress and then oppress people anywhere. And I think, uh, just one more thing I wanted to say, in addition to that, I think debate teaches fallibility. I think one problem in current democratic societies is that a lot of people think they have a monopoly on the truth right, that, and so they're not open to having their mind changed, they're not open to evidence that might uh, persuade them differently, right, because they think they already know the truth, that they're infallible. I think the one thing that the debate, debate teaches many things, but one thing it teaches is fallibility, right? It's kind of the more you know, the more you don't know. Right, which I think opens yourself, what opens us all up to more collaboration, wanting to know more viewpoints, wanting to know uh, more perspectives, right, in order to make the best decision that we can make in a world where we can't know everything. Thank you very much. Thank you for the very inspiring talk, so. I came here, I took a paid holiday, I am a senior high school teacher and I work with several Americans. They speak a lot, like you, <laughs> but most of the Japanese teachers don't speak a lot. And as you told you, told this talk, as you said, that most of the Japanese students are so shy. The one question, do you have a shy American student? And if you have to teach debate to the, such a shy student, how do you approach them? And if you have some suggestion, how to approach the shy Japanese student, and in a sense, uh, teaching debate? Oh yeah, I love this question. <laughs> so, a little bit of word about my Morehouse debate program, as much as I love those guys. Most of them, when they join the team, this is a college debate team, most of them, my students at least, did not debate in high school. We do not offer any debate scholarships. Some, some colleges and universities do that. They can recruit, they can throw money at the star debaters from high school and get them to come join their collegiate teams so they can have success. I, unfortunately, don't have that benefit. So that means the majority of my students are like walk-ons. They just they heard about the debate team or the debate program on campus and decided to show up and practice one day knowing absolutely nothing substantively about how to debate or how to argue and most importantly, never having done it before. And when I, in my program, we do a lot of exhibition debates. So we do big speeches in front of big crowds. That means they will present in front of anywhere from 200 to 3,000 people that they've never done this before when they come to me. They're, they're novices, they're true, they don't know anything. So to answer your question, what do I do? How do I prepare them? Let me assure you they're shy. <laughs> Let me assure you, assure you they're scared, they're intimidated. Even some of my best, who I consider my best students, when I let them know, hey, next week, you're gonna do an exhibition because you're one of my top debaters and you're gonna speak in front of 3,000 people, okay? 
they're not excited about it. They're not like, yes, I can't wait for this opportunity, coach. They're more like, hey, how are you going to prepare me to do this? Because I am terrified. So there are three things that I do. Number one, and this is in no particular order, I try everything I can to prepare them for the speaking situation that they're going to be in. So if that's going to be on a big stage in front of a large audience, that means I'm going to take them to a big auditorium on campus, and I'm going to put them on that stage with the microphone just so they can hear what they sound like when they speak on a microphone in front of a, in front of a, lar in a large venue, because it's very different than speaking in, say, a classroom like this, where I have to project my voice and I don't have the aid of a microphone. These are very different speaking skills. So I put them in the situation. That helps to build confidence and comfort. Secondly, I prepare them. They prepare themselves. Preparation, 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 preparation. There is absolutely no substitute for the prior preparation. I always tell them they have to do the work. If that means it's a research-based debate, they have to do the research. If that means they're gonna, they have to present a very rhetorically powerful speech, that means they're going to have to practice it several times to make sure they can know the proper pauses and the power of their words and what places to emphasize. But they have to prepare, prepare, prepare. Um, I'm fond of, uh, of, uh, of war analogy. So in, in the art of war, Sun Tzu said, every battle is won before it is fought. And that's sort of how I look at debate. You're going to debate, you're going into war. If you want to win, you're going to win before you step in the room, not the moment you step in the room. So you have to prepare, you have to prepare. And then third, and this may feel a little controversial, it, it's kind of like, this is a crude analogy, teaching a kid to swim and you just kind of throw them in, and it's deep, and so they have no choice. They have to swim, they have to survive. At some point, you have to throw them into some type of fire. Uh, they may get burned, but they have to experience it. They, 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 there's no way to do the thing in order, in, other than doing the thing at, at some point. And so we simulate this in practice, right? Whether it's in front of their peers first, a comfortable audience in practice, or whether it's taking them to tournaments, usually before I would put someone on a big stage in front of a large crowd, I'll have them debating in classrooms first. Uh, in front of strangers, not exactly the same, but it's but it's warming them up. Um, I don't think I ever take away their fear of public speaking. Certainly not the first time, or maybe even the second time, or the third time. But by the time they get to like the tenth time, and they've done it a few times, and they see, you know what? I did a lot of preparation. I was prepared for this context. I know what I'm talking about. I know enough argumentation and theory to defend myself and to defend my position, then they start building this confidence because really, what is fear? Fear, I think of fear as an acronym, F-E-A-R. False evidence appearing real. And the greatest thing about that is that it's not real. It's just fear. And once you realize that your fears are not real, they're just things that have been made up in your mind, anxieties that you create, self-inflicted, then you can get past them. But I always have fear. In fact, I, I don't think you're a good public speaker if you don't have some fear. Before I came into this room, you would not believe it, I had some fear. I had a little feeling in my stomach like, oh my gosh, I've never spoken in Japan before. I've never been in Japan before. This is only my second day in Japan. And how is this Japanese audience going to receive me? The culture's going to be different. When I try to get them to participate, will they even try to participate in the lecture? Or will I just be talking to a bunch of people sitting way in the back of the room? Yeah, but you have to use that. You have to take that fear that you have, that feeling in your belly, and you have to use that fire not to burn you, but to inflame your passion for whatever it is you're talking about. And that is where my passion comes from. It comes from that fear, but it comes from also because I care about what I'm saying. And you should too. Yeah, and, uh, at Vanderbilt I teach public speaking classes. And one of the first days of the of the semester, we talk about communication anxiety. And most people have communication anxiety. There have been studies done and surveys done. What are people's number one fear? And in the United States, people's number one fear a lot of times is public speaking. And number two is death, right? Uh, which uh, American comedian Jerry Seinfeld has a joke about that. He's like, I read that people's number one fear 
is public speaking, and people's number two fear is death. So when you're at a funeral, right, you'd rather be in the coffin than given a eulogy, right? So I say, I tell my students, one thing I hope that is accomplished during this 15 weeks is that you'd rather be giving the eulogy than being in the coffin at a funeral, right? And I tell them, if you, if you want me to completely relieve your communication anxiety, and it's not going to happen, it's probably not going to happen in your lifetime. As Ken said, right, Ken's been doing debate for a long time, and I tell my students, you know, I've been doing debate for 20 plus years, I've, I was in theater, right, I've spoke, I get up every semester in front of this classroom, but that first day in that classroom, right, meeting a new group of students for the first time, there's still some jitter. So the question is, how do we, so the question isn't, right, how do I completely get rid of any communication anxiety related to public speaking and debate? The question is, how do I still give public speeches and debate, right, while having this uh, anxiety around communication? And there's a lot of different techniques that, you know, people can use, but the number one thing goes to Ken's point. You just have to do it, right? The number one way you're going to relieve your communication anxiety and get to a point where you feel comfortable speaking in front of people is by doing it. So I tell my students, right, you're going to be in front of this classroom, this group of 15 to 20 of us, and you're going to give 10 to 12 speeches this semester. And the first time you get up there, you're probably going to have a lot of communication anxiety. But I promise you, by the 12th time you do it, right, you're not going to have that level of communication anxiety anymore. And, uh, as debate coaches, I think we all deal with this. We get novices in, right, who've never done debate. And even if a debate is two on two with just a judge, right, they're still very nervous about that public speaking situation. And, but they're not going to overcome that until they actually do it. So it's just giving people the opportunity to get up in front of a classroom or an audience and allowing them to find their own voice and what makes them comfortable speaking in front of others. Well, one more piece of practical advice for you since you're a high school teacher. It's an exercise, it's an introductory speech exercise that I use often with my introductory debate classes in college. It's called the balloon exercise. What you do is you tell every student to imagine that they're anyone, dead or alive, they could be anyone they want, but they're in a balloon, a hot air balloon. It's, it's, it's sinking, it's going to crash in the ocean unless you throw someone out. And so you can pick and be whoever you want, and then everyone has to give a one minute speech based on whoever they've chosen to be, uh, and make an argument, no more than one minute, 60 seconds, about why they shouldn't be thrown out of the balloon based on who they are. Try that exercise. It's very fun. It often gets new debaters who are not, or new people who are uncomfortable with public speaking, it gets them to speaking. It gets them to talking. And then you get to the second part of the exercise where you say, okay, now I want you all to decide, half of the class decide who's getting thrown out, and then half of the class decide to defend yourselves. And then you start, then they start debating. They don't even notice it. But before they know it, they're debating, they're, rebut they're, they're giving rebuttals, and it's very easy for them because it's based on information that they've already chosen because they've chosen to be a superhero or they've chosen to be someone who's very famous as a celebrity or whoever they want to be, it doesn't matter. The point is you're getting them speaking in front of their peers and you're getting them enjoying it. Yeah, uh, I'm sure Ken might have a similar experience on, on my teaching evaluations at Vanderbilt, a lot of times it's the fun games like that that they really talk about, like, we wish we could have done more of these fun exercises, right, where we're giving speeches and debating without really even knowing we're speaking or debating, right? So I actually do the hot air balloon one as well. Another one that I do is I have them choose a career, so they can be anything. So people pick, like, I'm a lawyer or a doctor or any number of things, and then what they have to do, and then I tell them, well, you are all in a zombie apocalypse, and you've encountered a building, and, they, and it's a safe building, but they can only let one of you in. So choosing nothing but your career, you only have your career to argue from, argue why they should let you into the safe house during the zombie apocalypse. And it's fun games like that, where they don't really even, where they're having fun, they don't even really know they're making arguments or engaging in speeches or debate that seem to be helpful in getting people to feel more comfortable talking in front of their peers. Um, I'd like to welcome questions or comments from students. You can ask a question in Japanese if you want. You can always translate. 
made very simple, naive questions are also welcome. You can ask me non-debate questions if you like. Okay, may, may I ask a simple, naive question? Please? Yeah, I, I guess lawyers make more money than college professors. <laughs> and <laughs> I wonder why you also teach debate uh, just, rather than just sticking to the uh, profession. Ah, that's a good question. So he says, why? What are you doing here? Why are you teaching debate if you could just be a rich lawyer? Um, and for me, it's kind of that simple that, you know, practice of law can generate you a good income, but it doesn't fulfill the soul. And so for me, uh, there's a famous Morehouse alum theologian, his name is Dr. Howard Thurman. Uh, and he writes, there's a lot of writing about something called the sound of the genuine. What is the sound of the genuine? It's that, it's that call, that, that inner voice that we all have that when we hear it, we know this is our calling in life. This is what I was meant to do. This is who I am. When you hear that call, you can't ignore it. In my case, the call literally came from my old debate coach from Browse College who called me in 2011 and said, hey, you want to coach the Morehouse debate team? And I was like, yeah. I had, before that moment, I hadn't even sought out debate as a career. Uh, I hadn't even sought to become a professor. I literally got a phone call. And after I got the call, I hung up the phone, and I can't explain it, but I knew it was something I was supposed to do. And I continue to do it, not because of the pay, doesn't pay. Being a debate coach doesn't pay. Uh, but being a debate professor doesn't pay. You can barely retire on it, right? Uh, it's just not that type of thing. Uh, but it is incredibly personally fulfilling. After all, my law practice does not take me around the world. I've, I've taught debate workshops or given debate lectures. Uh, on almost every continent, from the Caribbean to South America to Africa. Uh, I really haven't done much in Europe. Their debate circuit's very well developed. But in Asia, uh, India, Bangladesh, now Japan. Um, and so I w if I wasn't involved in debate as a second career, if you will, as a professor, then I wouldn't have done any of that. But more importantly, the students whose lives I've touched and whose lives have touched me because it's always sort of a symbiotic relationship. In other words, as much as I think I like to believe I give, I know I probably receive uh, even more from these journeys and from these exchanges. And even when I get like a Facebook message five years after a training, like, hey, did you know you told me something or you said something in a workshop and it inspired this, I like changed my whole life. And I'm like, wow, you did? I slipped up when I said that, but good. Good, good, I'm glad you're enjoying your life. But seriously, I, I really appreciate those comments, and it's meaningful to me. I find personal meaning and gratification and believe in the same way that when workers go in things like the Peace Corps, and they go to different countries, and they're, they're, they're building dams, or they're, they're helping to establish a water irrigation system to help feed the community. I believe the work that I'm doing, that John is doing, that other of my big professors and colleagues are doing, and sort of proselytizing about debate and debate culture is helping to develop uh, countries, people, and cultures in a different way that is lasting and sustaining and I find meaningful. Thank you. And similar question to John. Uh, did you think about any alternative career when you got into the code? Yeah, I probably think like a lot of debaters, we thought we were going to go to law school. Ken, <laughs> Ken did go to law school and a lot of debaters do go to law school, but I pretty much thought during most of my time in college I was going to go to law school, but I think very similar to Ken's answer, right, I was like, am I going to be happy going to law school? Am I going to be happy being a lawyer, right? What do I want to do with my life? What do I care about, right? And as I talked about today, I cared about debate. I cared about democracy. I care about, you know, giving people a skill that I think is very valuable that's going to change their lives well, like it changed my life. Like I've said a couple times already, uh, my, I come from a family where only one of my grandparents graduated high school. Mom and dad graduated high school. My mother was a, a teacher, was a, a uh, an assistant teacher in a classroom of children with special needs. And my father worked at a steel mill for 43 years, right? So, um, Debate, 
uh, gave me a lot of opportunities I wouldn't otherwise have. I, I, uh, I'm probably in double digits now in countries I visited that I wouldn't have visited otherwise. I've been to 48 U.S. states. Uh, just got a couple more to go to get to every U.S. state, and those aren't opportunities that my parents and grandparents had. Those aren't opportunities that a lot of people have where I come from in rural Ohio. I mean, so debate changed my life, and I just wanted to, I guess, commit my life to trying to give back those same opportunities that it gave to me. Thank you. Any questions? Do, do you think scientists uh, should have debate? So, uh, should scientists have debate? I, I, I talk about, I mean, science is debate, right? The scientific method is debate. We're building knowledge, right? And knowledge is usually built through debate and experiments. And I think a lot of times we talk about science and medicine, we try to review them as being separate from debate when they aren't, right? Uh, and this goes back to my point about fallibility. Doctors aren't infallible, right? Scientists aren't infallible. They have methods to try to get at the best result, and other people will look at those and try to replicate them and debate them. But when you visit a doctor, right, they're trying to figure out the diagnosis. And then when, once they, then they might bring in other colleagues and debate what the correct diagnosis is, right? What they're doing is collecting evidence. They're comparing that evidence against other cases where similar evidence was present to try to reach that diagnosis. And then once the diagnosis is reached, right, then you're then they're trying to figure out what's the best course of action in order to treat that disease, right? So, uh, oh, Ken doesn't mind, but Ken and I both have diabetes, and we both, uh, which is a non-common in the United States, and we are comparing the types of medicine we're on, because there's tons of different diabetes medicine that you can be on, and so your doctor might be consulting and debating with others, right, about what's the best course of action to treat this case, of diabetes. And then when you're seeing your doctor, right, I'm on a drug called Monjaro, I used to be on a drug called Ozempic, Ken is on Trulicity. They're all very similar types of medicine that, that offer different benefits, right? So you're also engaging in a dialogue or a debate with your doctor about which of those medicines to go on. So I think a lot of times we like to separate things in society from not being a debate when really debate's really everywhere, right? There's nothing that is outside of debate. So learning those skills as a scientist, a doctor, are critically important. Um, to briefly answer that question, I want to start with a definition of debate. Because we've been talking a lot about debate. Debate, 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 debate. But what is debate? And you will find that in the literature, scholars even have slightly different definitions for the word debate. And in different societies, the word itself, debate, means different things. When I use the word debate, here's my definition that I always use. What's debate? Debate is the search for truth through well-reasoned argumentation. That's what debate is for me. The search for truth through well-reasoned argumentation. And if you apply that definition of debate to science, for example, then you'll start to recognize both why people may perceive initially Debate's not needed in science, but then when you think deeper about it, you realize absolutely you must have debate in science. And debate is important to science. Why? Because in science, we perceive science to be composed of a set of objective truths, right? There's an equation for that. Right? There's an equation for E equals MC squared, right? I haven't proved it. There's an equation for gravity. That's a constant. It is what it is. It's a scientific fact. Except for the fact that there are so many things in science that actually aren't facts. There's so many things in science that are actually theories. What's a scientific theory? Any scientific theory, by definition, is something that is not yet proven or established to be a fact. That's why they're still calling it a scientific theory. And even in science, things that we think are true change over time. They change over time. If we think of time as a longer period of time, at one point, science didn't believe that the Earth revolved around the Sun, for example, right? We obviously know that's, that's not true. Fast forward a more contemporary example. At one time, we thought that nothing could escape a black hole. You ever hear that? Nothing can escape a black hole. 
Then we learned about Hawking radiation. What? You mean there's stuff outside of black hole that escapes? Well, Stephen Hawking showed that there is. So he challenged some of our notions of truth in that respect. And that's what debate does. Through well-reasoned argumentation, when it's done right, but it's all searching for the same thing. In academic debate, we search for the truth of the proposition or the resolution or the motion. That's why we have a, a, a simple, straightforward declarative statement that gets debated, and each side is arguing for the truth of their side of the position. But no matter what the field is, we all aspire to know or to discern the truth, even when there may not be an objective truth. We still aspire for it. And that's what debate gives us. It gives us the ability to have that dialogue and that discussion so that hopefully, even if we don't know the truth at the end, we get a little bit closer. Um, whether debate is such for truth is a big question. And, and uh, probably philosophically it's true, but if you apply it to completely debate, especially one single round, do you still think uh, one single round of computer debate is a search for truth? That's a tricky question. It's kind of loaded, isn't it? <laughs> um, so he's asking, do I think if in a particular round it's necessarily about the search for truth? And I guess that depends on the judge, frankly, and the judge's philosophy. You know, different judges do judge debates differently. Uh, for lack of a better way of describing it. Some judges say, I don't really care about what the objective truth may be in the world. I'm going to be what's called tabula rasa, uh, which is Latin for my mind's going to be a blank slate. And I'm going to decide this debate solely based on the arguments that were presented in front of me and who won the debate that's before me. There may be, someone may be presenting arguments that are wrong. The judge may know, oh my gosh, everything that speaker said is wrong. But in the round, their opponent didn't point it out <laughs> and didn't explain adequately why that position was flawed. So in that debate, the judge is going to give the victory to the person who had the flawed position because their opponent didn't do their job of effectively refuting that flawed position. I still think in that instance, even though outside of the context of that debate, truth didn't prevail, but the truth of that round, the truth of that moment, did prevail as it was presented to the judge, is the way I reconcile that. Okay, um, it's almost time, but uh, maybe I can take one last question. Thank you for your lecture. Uh, I learned how important the debate is. And then I have a question. A Kyoso students have many, have many times to talk, others, talk with others, like group works and team-based learning. But how, uh, what do you think of how different the um, value of group works? Like uh, debate, I, I learned debates has uh, uh, to make students confident to make their stand up their opinions, but also group works or team based learning has opportunities to talk their opinions. So, what do you think of the difference? Well, why do you climb to debates? So um, the way I understand the question is, I guess, what is the difference between debate and like group work, right? What are the differences in that? And I think that um, there's there's certainly some similarities and differences, right? When you're given group work, you do have to uh, you have something that you have to accomplish, right? You have to there's a set thing you have to accomplish, like with the debate, right? There's a set motion. There's something you have to talk about within group work, right? There's probably something that is particular to that assignment. And then other similarities, right, is that once you have that, you have to talk to each other. 
might be a difference, right? In group work, you might all reach consensus, right? You might all debate with each other and go, well, this is the thing that we're going to present to the teacher, right? So the, de the debate within the group work results in a product that you all have consensus on, while in debate, you aren't necessarily going to come to a consensus with those that you are debating within a debate round, but over the course of several debates, you might all arrive at the same conclusion. You're just not forced to do so. So I think it's teaching similar skills. You're just not getting, to, with debate, you're not necessarily getting to that end point of universal consensus in order to present a product that you all agree with and are willing to defend in front of a teacher. So I have three things to say about that. Um, first, debate is, can be thought of as one method of making decisions. It's a decision-making tool. This is not, I, I'm not the first one to say this. This, if you look at if you read a book called Argumentation and Debate by Freely and Steinberg, Steinberg's still alive. Freely's not, but Steinberg's the coach at the University of Miami. And within that book, he compares and contrasts debate with different forms of decision making, including group decision group decision making. Because there are some times where debate is sort of, I would say, the best way to try to make a decision, and there are other times where it's not where there are other methods of decision making that might be more appropriate for a given context, like group decision making. So I would not, um, I would not castigate either one. I would recognize they are what they are. Debate is a tool. Uh, group decision making is another tool that's appropriate for some circumstances, but not, might, might not be the best in others. Secondly, even when you're in a group, you have to recognize that you still may get into debates, right? And the, the way you can see that is usually when you're in a debate, it's very rare that you're going to convince your adversary. You learn this very quickly in competition, right? The debate's not about convincing your adversary that you're right. The who's the debate about? It's about the audience. It's about everyone else. So if you're in a group and you have someone else in the group who disagrees with you about something, which very often happens when you're doing group or team work, who are you trying to convince to go your way? Well, it's probably not the person that's diametrically opposed to you. The first line of persuasion is probably the other members of the group. Because if everyone else in the group who doesn't have a strong opinion one way or the other, they, who, they become your audience, they become your judges. And if you persuade them of the truth of your position, then all of a sudden now the majority of the group feels one way, your way, and then that person who disagreed with you is saying, okay, fine, fine, I still don't agree, but fine, I'll go with the group decision on that. So you just effectively used your debating skills or techniques from debate, whether you were consciously aware of it or not, in order to really affect, uh, to affect that group dynamic. And so uh, that's kind of a plug to say that yes, group work is valuable, but it's certainly no reason you shouldn't learn debating skills. You should. Thank you very much. Um, we all the over time, and uh, I, I hope uh, you got something from this talk and uh, discussion. Uh, thank you very much for attending the first session of this uh, spring Years Exchange debate. And we have about 20 minute recess, and then uh, next session starts um, 2.50 um, with the policy debate, so called the uh, we review the high school topic of Japan, the about gestational surrogacy. Okay, please come back to the room to fifty. Thank you very much. And thank you.